Hi everyone, this is Lyle from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. In this video, we're going to set up an experiment that will help you discover what types of melting ice contribute to sea level rise. Maybe you've heard that melting ice adds to sea level rise, but did you know that it makes a difference where that ice is? Take a moment to think about the types of ice that can be found in nature. Make a list on paper or in your head, then sort it into two groups, ice that's found on land and ice that's found at sea. Now think about that ice as it melts and predict which type of ice, land ice or sea ice, will add more to sea level rise while the ice melts. With your prediction in mind, let's get started setting up your experiment. You'll need a few things. Two identical clear plastic containers about six by six inches. If you don't have that size or they're not identical, that's okay. At least try to find similar containers. You'll also need some clay about enough to make one to two inch tall chunks that will represent land in each tub. If you don't have clay, try using some small rocks that you can pile up in the tub and place ice on top of. That brings us to our next item, ice. Having a full tray of ice will be helpful. You might not need all of it, but if you have that much, that'd be great. Then get some cold water, a ruler if you have one, and a marking pen if you have one. Take your clay and press equal amounts into one side of both plastic containers, making a smooth, flat surface representing land. Again, if you don't have clay, try piling some small rocks into the tub to represent land. In one container, put as many ice cubes as possible on the flat clay or rock pile. This represents land ice. In the other container, place the same number of ice cubes on the bottom of the container, next to the land. This represents sea ice. Then pour cold water into the sea ice container until the ice floats. Make sure none of the ice is resting on the bottom of the container and that the water isn't higher than the land. Without disturbing the ice cubes on land, add water to the land ice container until the water level is about equal to the water level in the sea ice container. With water in both containers, carefully measure the water level in each container, in millimeters if you can, and record that data on a piece of paper. If you don't have a ruler, you can use a pencil tip to make a line in the clay that shows where the water level is, or you can also put a mark on the outside of the containers with a marker. But keep in mind, the ink might not come off. Now it's time to be patient while the ice melts. While it's melting, make regular measurements of the water level in each container, maybe every minute if the ice is melting quickly, or every five minutes if it's melting slowly. Keep recording measurements until the ice is melted in each container. For an added challenge, graph your data, either on paper or using spreadsheet software. Now that you've collected your data, think about what your observations mean for melting ice around the planet. In which container did water rise more? Why do you think that occurred? How does that compare to your prediction? Based on what you observed, does the melting of Earth's glaciers on land contribute to sea level rise? For more details on this activity and links to other sea level and Earth science projects you can do at home, Visit the URL on the screen or click the link in the video description. Hi everyone, this is Lyle from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. In this video, we're going to set up an experiment that will help you discover one of the main things that contributes to sea level rise. Maybe you've heard that melting ice adds to sea level rise, but did you know that the warming of ocean water also raises the sea level? As temperatures around the planet rise, the temperature of ocean water also rises. This causes something called thermal expansion. Thermal expansion causes the volume of water, or the amount of space it takes up, to increase. You can make a model at home to demonstrate this phenomenon using some simple items you might have around the house. Start by gathering your materials. You'll need a water bottle. I'm using a recyclable bottle, but reusable ones made out of thick, sturdy plastic work too. You'll also need a clear plastic drinking straw, clay, putty, or a similar soft, flexible sealant to seal the top of the bottle, a marking pen, and a ruler if you have one. To add heat, you'll need a heat pad, a heat lamp, or an incandescent light bulb. If you don't have any of those, sunlight works too. If you have a kitchen thermometer with a metal probe that goes into food, or a stick-on thermometer, you can use those to measure the temperature of the water. I didn't use one in my experiment, but I'll show you how you can use one a little later. The first thing you'll need to do is fill the water bottle to the rim with water. You can add a few drops of food coloring to make the water more visible, but it's not required. 
Now wrap the straw with clay, leaving a few inches of straw above and below the clay. Be careful not to squeeze the straw closed. Make sure the clay, putty, or whatever sealant you use fills any gaps between the hole and the straw. Try to keep the straw as close to vertical as possible as you put it into the bottle and seal the top. There are different ways to do this, but the most important thing is to make sure no water can leak out of the bottle. Don't worry if a little water spills as you seal up the top, just have a towel ready to clean it up. If you're going to use a thermometer, now is the time to insert it through the clay. It might look something like this. There should be a little water in the straw above the clay. You'll want to put the water bottle in the spot you plan to add heat, because moving and squeezing the bottle can mess up your measurements. Once you have your spot, use a marking pen to make a line where the water level is. This is where you'll measure from throughout your observations. Now it's time to apply heat. Because different heat sources apply heat with different intensities, it's important to keep watching the water bottle to make sure the heat isn't damaging it. At regular intervals, maybe every minute or every five minutes, depending on how strong the heat source is, measure and record the water level in millimeters starting from the zero mark you made on the straw. If you don't have a ruler, simply observe what's happening to the water level and make a note of it on a piece of paper. If you're using a thermometer, record the temperature at each interval too. There's no specific amount of time to observe and record, but after you've collected enough data to notice a pattern or trend in the water level and temperature, write a description of what you observe in the straw. Graph your measurements on paper or using spreadsheet software if you have any. Think about what happened to the water level as heat energy was added and think about how this relates to increasing global temperatures and sea level rise. For more details on this activity and ideas for more projects you can do at home, visit the URL on the screen or click the link in the video description. Hi everyone, this is Brandon from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and today I'm going to talk to you about our water filtration activity. Earth's natural life support system provides the air we breathe, the water we drink, and other conditions that support life. Sometimes our Earth resources become polluted and require cleanup. These cleanups can be natural, like wetlands filtering water, or human-made, like soil washing technologies to clean up polluted ground. There's also a need for water filtration systems beyond Earth, like for astronauts on the International Space Station. The water recovery system provides clean water by reclaiming wastewater, including water from crew member urine, hand washing, and teeth brushing, then filtering it to reuse as clean water. By doing so, the system reduces how much water needs to be launched from Earth to support crew members on the ISS. It's that filtration that we're going to look at in our activity today. To begin, you'll need to gather some materials to act as your filter. You can try conducting your filtration using simple household items like cotton balls, maybe gravel from outside, or macaroni oval. When I'm building a water filter, I like to start by taking a water bottle and cutting it in half. As such, I have a portion that I'm going to put my materials that will act as my filter on the top, and then a vessel that will collect the hopefully clean filtered water below. I want to be able to keep my filter material in the top section, so I went to my first aid kit and grabbed a piece of gauze. Securing that with a rubber band will allow all of the material on the top to stay there and the water to be cleaned to permeate to the bottom. And just what will you be filtering? Well, that's up to you. You could start by taking some soil from outside and mixing that with water. Or if you're looking for a little bit more of a challenge, try adding vinegar or food coloring to see if that can be separated as well. Design your filter by layering or mixing the materials in the top bottle. Make a sketch of your design to improve it later. Be sure to document how much and which types of materials you've used as well. Pour your simulated wastewater into the top of your filter and observe the water that comes out. Try to gauge how effective your filter was by observing how much water was filtered, how clean the water is, and how long it took. Remember, even if it looks clean, you should never drink it because it may still contain pollutants that you can't see. For more details on this activity, visit this page or click the link in the description and check out the JPL Education website for more fun activities to try from home.